as you can see, I'm very large in size. And that should not amaze you because mom always ensured that I had my fill at the dinner table. And indeed, my siblings still complain up to this day that I'm the only one who was allowed to have a second helping on the dinner table. Well, that was then. What amazed me when I walked into prison so many years ago was that I was handed over one of the biggest tin plates I'd ever seen in my life. And for a moment, I thought that maybe mom had called the officer in charge and told him to expect me and keep up the family tradition. Well, it was big, as you can see, but it was largely empty. And for the first time in my life, I stopped. And therein began my journey of transition. Remand was like a mini United Nations, where we had people of all diverse nationalities, ages, creed, and tribe. We also had very young children, some young enough to be my children's age, who are wasting away their time in prison, not knowing why they're there, and even had to play caregiver to some who are almost my parents' and grandparents' ages. My conviction was jolted, however, when I was convicted to suffer death for an offense I never committed. Today, I want to talk to you about how my conscience was spring to, to, to start an anti-crime advocacy group and to do something about crime in our country. I had a mental transition when I was on death row with my colleagues. And together with them, we formed an advocacy group called Crime Sipoa, or Crime Is Not Cool, whose remit was and remains to advocate against crime, activities that threaten peace, all kinds of incidences and fear of crime, and just to tell people to live a different kind of life. The trigger mechanism, as I've said, that led me to do this was that there are so many youth getting into crime not knowing the consequences of their actions. The hunger pangs that I felt on the first night when I was given that big tin plate soon turned out to a hunger to make a better country and to get it safer. Writing appeals for my colleagues, listening to their sad stories, and, and, and just counseling and sitting with them made me know that many of them did not know why exactly they could, why they committed crime. I remember many of my colleagues in prison are not in prison for anything spectacular. Many are in for maybe robbing phones, maybe being caught up with uh, two weeds of bang. But another more spectacular issue that everyone should take note of, I had a colleague on death row who was there not for anything else, but because he had carjacked a busload of passengers to get money, money to take his girlfriend out for dinner. Well, he never made it to that date. He ended up in prison, and he also lost that girl. Now, these sad stories might move me to see how the youth can be used, or how we can do it ourselves, me included, to get the youth to move from crime and to do something very positive in their lives. Our initial focus and drive came from the goodwill we got from the Kenya Prison Service. They gave us their full support. They walked with us the talk. And now a hitherto reviled department that everyone was talking negatively about was here championing a course that was being propagated by inmates and ex-inmates. It was a different and welcoming opportunity. As we walked this talk and the community came up, we saw that we were getting feedback, very positive feedback from the public and also from our colleagues who were embracing the concept. And we realized that every citizen needed to embrace the crime initi anti-crime initiative. Now we sought out to build a very serious and vibrant anti-crime uh, advocacy group, the Crime Sipoa, as a lifestyle. It's not about Pete, it's not about Mr. Kisingu, it's not about anybody here. It's about each and every single Kenyan and visitor to Kenya who comes and decides that we have to use the opportunities to change our country and make it safer. We realize that crime does not just affect inmates and their victims. Crime affects every single person in every nook and cranny of this country and the world as large. Now, eradicating crime is not something we should take for granted. Crime affects 70% of the over 43 million population we have in this country. It's not something that we are going to take for granted and wish away. But we have to realize one thing, that the opportunities we have for solving crime and insecurity far outweigh the challenges posed by crime. Thus, as Crime Sipoa, our focus, both in committee and those who are outside, is on prevention, and we want to ensure that we do advocacy and training as much as we can. I'm always reminded of the words of John F. Kennedy, who continued reminding me in my prison cell that I should not think or ask myself what my country had done for me. 
but rather I should ask myself what I was going to do or what I'm doing to make my country safer. It did not matter the conditions under which I found myself at you know, that time. Now, something crazy happened here. I've never been good in figures before. But I realized that in this financial year, our country dedicated 2.12 billion US dollars to its security docket. That translates to about 223 billion Kenyan shillings in a country with a poverty index of 51%, living below the poverty line, according to the latest World Bank figures. Whereas many will say that figure is astronomical, it's huge, we agree. But how many are offering the solution, the suggestions on how to get, it, to get our country safe? This is a country where some lazy armchair journalists the other day called a hotbed of terror. But we don't think so. Kenya is not any other country. Kenya hosts a United Nations head office. Kenya is home to different and many foreign missions and embassies. Kenya also has some of the most spectacular wildlife and tourism heritage you'll ever find in this world. And that's why when someone says Kenya is a hotbed of terror, we say committee is a hotbed of reforms. <laughs> Simply put, if our security collapses, we are looking at lives and inhabitants of, of tens of millions of people in the region as well as in the Great Lakes area being affected directly and businesses also being affected directly. So we noticed there was a gap in strategy. In as much as we sit in prison, we are allowed televisions, I'll let you know that, and we see what's happening real time. So what happened is we noticed there's a gap in strategy where more and more funds are being used and channeled to crime eradication and less focus is being put in the most basic component in crime eradication, which is the people. And so what do we do as crime people? We decide now, we want to show you how using the crime sweeper concept, we can make our country safer, reduce expenditure by a very big margin, if only we can get 10% of the country to assist the government and the law enforcement to talk about crime. Just talk. Just say crime is not cool. Practice it in your offices. Practice it wherever you are. In your homes, just say it, and you'll see the immediate change. How do we do that? From committee, with the grant permission of our boss and the commissioner, the ex-inmates are helping us as well. And now, we have a website. We have a page on Facebook. We want you to talk about your experiences. We want you to talk about your estates. We want to know why you feel crime is not cool in your estate. You can also move on and learn about real life experiences from inmates who've been in prison and who know what crime means to them and their lives. We also use advocacy, we use cleanups, we do mobilization. We also shoot infomercials and documentaries, which inmates, both present and ex-inmates, talk about the adverse effects of crime as they advise the society and people on why they should not be involved in crime at all. Well, as you can see, we have lots of cleanups. That's all done in collaboration with our prison system. We have our outreach programs all over the country. We had that in Hola, Ongatarongai. We have Eldoret. We have Muranga, we have Makadara, we have Kisumu. We've been doing it from the prisons. Many people know about Crime Sipoa, but all that has been done is being coordinated from the prisons department headquarters, and we are getting the support from the law enforcement. <laughs> so this kind of impactful interventions that we've seen, we're getting the support from the, the, the administration, both in the prisons and giving us that opportunity, has given us the feedback and the morale to put the process forward and know that even though we had fears initially on how the public would receive the concept, now they are fully embracing it and fully participating in it. We've had been here from where we started to a prison cell. That is where we started. That's where our dream started. But where are we now? With good partnership and support, we've been granted that office by a benefactor who's decided that we need to be more presentable and shows you the kind of impact now that Crime Sipo is having right from the prisons and changing the world. Our desire is to see that all savings are accruing from our interventions in society and all that we are doing in our small way is channeled to, crime, is channeled to more productive uh, sectors of the economy where jobs can be created, the youth can get employment, and we have less crime uh, figures on it. Now, our anchor partners have said again, they've allowed us graciously to operate from all 119 prisons countrywide meaning that we can have 119 prisons without spending an extra cent from where we can coordinate and operate from and reach the entire community. We're really, really grateful for all that they've done. 
But you also have a role to play. We all have a role to play. Maybe you're asking, what are we doing in prisons? We do that. We have organic farming. This is all in prison. We reach out, we have beauty contests, we have our nursery, we have our fish pond. We have our dance groups. We have motivational speakers coming to talk to us. We do art and design, as you see. And now you see our partners, they're assisting us. That is the officer in charge of committee doing cleanup in the public. He doesn't just talk from here. We are not talking. We are walking the talk from committee. But you also have a role to play. Why don't you just purpose to make your life, your community, and your family a safe place? You play the biggest role in crime eradication. And I, I think today, as I stand on a world stage without chains in a maximum security prison, we just have to see that the kind of revolution that we've had, what has happened in the prisons, like Mr. Mwenda said previously, is a revolution. It's not just a transition. But we have to see to it that this revolution is carried forward. A revolution that can be only carried forward by people who believe and who support the cause. We are having courses that help us to reach out, to interact, and to listen to what the inmates say. We are, we are coordinating. This is the administration police. They're supporting us in what we are doing. You see the cleanups that we are doing in the estates. We are having that kind of impact when the youth decide to embrace it. They say, we want to support you. They don't charge us. They just come and offer their support, and they do what they have to do. Ongata Rongai, name it. These are the youth of this country who've decided, and they want you to believe, that we can make the country safe by our own initiative. Now, by investing in that, in the youth, listening to them, we've earned their trust. What happened next? They grant us dividends. So when they, we go out to do our cleanups, they come out. People are amazed when we went to Hola and 100 people had been, 100 lives had been lost. And from committee, and not too many people, I just asked the officer in charge from our budget here. We have a small account. It's totally worn out right now. But we had a small account there, and we managed to raise some money, and an ex inmate who walked from committee went to Hola when well-funded organizations did not want to touch Hola. 100 lives had been lost in Kelelangwani, and we did the biggest peace march in town, brought the warring communities together, and we thank God that we did our part. That is the march we are doing from committee. And, 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 and as we look at that, we just see the kind of passion and resolve that the youth have. But we are not giving them an opportunity. We'd love to have every single youth given an opportunity. So from the tunnel vision that I had seven years ago with my colleagues in my small dingy cell somewhere, we are now championing a global vision in which we want every single citizen to think about how to actively participate in crime situations, crime issues, and solve the perennial security challenges that face the country and face the world in the most cost efficacious manner. The time to deal with crime is now. We don't have any more time to waste. It's wasting us. And we have to take that lead from wherever you are. You have to take that lead. Crime is a human cause problem that affects all of us. And so it also needs a human-led, people-friendly solution that involves everyone. All of us must be involved in it. It's not just about government, it's not about someone or some NGO somewhere. Everyone must be involved with it. Because a crime-free Kenya means a better life for an entire region. Now, I'm reminded of one very serious speaker, Martin Luther King, who said that the hope of a secure and livable world lies with disciplined and conformists who are dedicated to justice, peace, and brotherhood. As you ask yourself where you sit today, I just want you to know that there's no fence to sit on. There's no two ways about solving crime. Every waking day, our kids look to us to give them a livable and safe environment. We have that opportunity to grant them. That's just one wish. Let our children enjoy their lives. Let our children enjoy peace and security. And we have the answer. You have the answer today. And the answer is in your voices. Thank you.